The South African Minister of International Relations, in her recent somewhat controversial visit to Russia, stated that we are living in a time of warlords, that uh, the reason why the world is so unstable is that. Kind of interesting thing to say in Russia, of all places, where the ultimate warlord is waging his war, but be that all as it may. It struck me, and probably a lot of other people as well, that there's a deeper issue. It's not as simplistic as living in an age of warlords. Quite frankly, rather bluntly, we're living in an age of fools, an age of idiots, it would seem. Let's not worry about how do you define a fool or an idiot, but it really seems that what lacks pretty much anywhere in leadership around the world is wisdom. It seems as if leaders are unable to benefit from the experience of others or the experience of history. It seems as if leaders are unable to think of some bigger picture other than themselves, bigger picture like their people or their country. And it seems as if decisions and choices are made which are self-serving and short-sighted. And maybe that would also be a bit of a definition of lacking wisdom. And yet we live in a world where we insist, it would seem, that leaders need to be the oldest members of society. And while perhaps in an archetypal sense, or a deep historical sense, there is automatically a lot of sense in that idea. It does seem that on the one hand, we have a lot of leaders who are older people lacking in wisdom, and that of course we have lots of young people who are presumably lacking in wisdom because of their youth, and yet full of fantastic ideas. And I often say, you know, I wish young people would rule the world. And people say to me, they lack wisdom. And so that is really why I'm asking this question. Where's the wisdom in the elders, in the older leaders? Does wisdom come automatically with age? And then if so, or if not, what is wisdom really? How do we find it? Can we acquire it? Can we cultivate it? And perhaps with that knowledge, choose better leaders. Wisdom is generally defined as the ability to act in a mature manner. So that's kind of why uh, we associate it with age or we expect it of older people. But really, wisdom is the assumption then in all of that, that a wise person or perhaps an older person is thinking and acting using knowledge and experience and understanding and common sense and hopefully some insight together in a way that is uh, useful, has a positive outcome and befitting of a mature person. And we also would expect of such a person that they would behave with experience and compassion and self-knowledge, self-knowledge being so important in the ability to be humble and to be compassionate and to think beyond oneself. It's also associated with non-attachment, ethical behavior, benevolent behavior, and so on. You know, even if you think about, when I hear myself saying those things, it kind of gets easier to see why do we have so few leaders who seem to embody those attributes. Because as desirable as they are, and kind of as obviously good as they are, they are not that easy to find all wrapped up in one person. Here in South Africa, we often associate those kind of things with Nelson Mandela. And while we, obviously he's still human and can't be expected to be a perfect figure, he was an embodiment of many of those qualities, knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, insight, self-knowledge, compassion, non-attachment, ethics, 
benevolence. I don't know for sure about his philosophies regarding non-attachment, but certainly he was very non-materialistic and rejected a lot of the material benefits that came to him after his release. So we do have a good model for that. And, and then when I say Nelson Mandela, perhaps it also becomes easy to see why are there so few people like that. But as I suggested in the introduction, perhaps it's something that we can cultivate. And even if it's cultivated kind of, you know, one bit at a time, you can't get all those qualities all at once. Every one of those qualities is unmistakably a significant step forward on that road to wisdom. When we look at what's been said about wisdom by philosophers or by um, commentators elsewhere, we can start all the way back at Aristotle, who defined wisdom as understanding why things happen in a certain way. In other words, understanding causes. He said, knowledge is knowing that things are a certain way, while wisdom is knowing why that is so. Well, it's a start. It might need what is also um, thought of by the Inuit. Uh, an Inuit elder said that a person becomes wise when they can see what needs to be done and can do it successfully without being told what to do. So that's an interesting step. And let's kind of assume that the understanding of causes is in there as well. But it's this ability then to respond to that and to know what to do and presumably to actually do that without any necessary input from others. When we look at more kind of contemporary approaches in psychology and neuropsychiatry, um, we see, for example, an idea from Leges who says that um, a theoretical definition that takes into account many cultural, religious, and philosophical themes is that wisdom represents a demonstrated superior ability to understand the nature and behavior of things, people, and events, which results in an increased ability to predict behavior or events, which may then be used to benefit self or others. It's comprehensive. It makes good sense. It doesn't really seem to elevate that person to a point where they have that deeper compassion and a kind of transpersonal beyond the self understanding. In fact, it just actually says to the benefit of self or others. And while that is true of wisdom, there's no, I don't think there's a requirement or an automatic assumption that wisdom means you allow others to benefit when you don't, or that there's nothing personal or selfish about wisdom. Indeed, if wisdom is an, a form of intelligence, especially a form of intelligence related to um, experience, knowledge, and all those other things I said early on, well then, it must be beneficial to ourselves, just like other knowledge is. But there is that um, element there in the Leges's definition that does suggest it's just like a sharper form of intelligence and we'll win because we are wiser. And maybe the wise person rather would not get into that battle that they would perhaps win. It is true that wisdom is a kind of expertise in dealing with difficult issues of life, difficult questions, the complexities of life. But wisdom then seems to include a certain amount of intelligence, perceptiveness, spirituality, and shrewdness, says the Jess. When we look at more spiritual approaches, take Buddhism, which we've been looking at on and off, and uh, other Eastern philosophies that we've seen over the last few weeks. In Buddhism, of course, wisdom comes from understanding the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, which I've discussed in the past, and I'm not going to get into them now, but basically the understanding of the core masses of life, such as the Four Noble Truths, that uh, life involves suffering, and that what we really need to do is detach ourselves from that suffering, and and through meditation and non-attachment, ultimately is how we're going to do that. And 
the eightfold path that helps us not harm others and so on. And all those which are often seen as religious precepts are really behaviors on how to be a human being treading lightly on the earth, not getting entangled in it too much because that causes our own suffering. So maybe what Buddhism is saying is that wisdom includes the understanding of what suffering is and the cause of what suffering is, as well as the ability to release it. And that by itself will also prevent us trying to gain an advantage over other people or gain undue benefit or resources to ourselves or anything like that. And of course, we do find in spiritual philosophies where we are going to find the, the greatest compassionate guidance to something like wisdom. In Hinduism, the other primary philosophy in India, basically wisdom is knowing yourself as the truth, the basis of the entire creation, that you are a part of, one with, the creation itself, the divine itself. Ultimately, wisdom arises uh, through self-awareness, self-realization. So not surprisingly, it is seen through a spiritual path as essentially a spiritual matter, a matter of uh, behaving in a certain way. You see that in the Buddhist and in the Hindu ideas, a kind of a typically spiritual idea of this is how we should behave. What is important also to take away from that is that it's, it might sound like that Hindu approach is elevating the individual to some special importance, but in fact the opposite is true because it ultimately says everyone is that. Everyone is part of exactly the same awareness. Self-awareness ultimately becomes awareness that self is other. Another philosophical trip we're not going to take right now, but it is important that distinctions between the individual selves are not made. I mean, Taoism, who we've also looked at briefly on and off in the last few weeks, um, says that we must go beyond the individual point of view. And that's the same as what Socrates says, that in order to acquire wisdom, it's acquired through discussion, not through thinking. So it involves others. It's an engagement with others and understanding that even if uh, in the group there's the one elder, Socrates, who becomes the wise one or who's seen as the wise one, he is entirely only so because of the group. So um, it's always got that idea of beyond the self and beneficial to everyone else as well. Ultimately, says Alex Fridera, um, wisdom is a way a path along which our thinking becomes proportionate, balanced, and expansive. It is a journey enriched by company. Getting back to my politicians for five minutes there, that would also be a beneficial view of where there is the wisdom of a group, not all invested in one person. And that might cultivate the idea of this is beneficial to all of us. Again, unfortunately, in much of modern politics, all of us often just means our particular political party and not anyone else, or our, um, our bunch of ruling elite and not even those who voted us in. That's the way it tends to go. But hopefully enough wisdom, even in the group, could prevent it going down that road. Certainly, the idea that it's beyond the individual and beyond the self is something that is increasingly agreed upon by psychological and philosophical views today. So Igor Grossman argues that uh, you, to understand wisdom, you need to remove the wise from their pedestal and see wisdom as a set of processes that we can all tap into as long as we have the right attitude and the right context. So generally, in order to get there, wisdom requires intellectual humility, understanding broader perspectives, knowing that things can change and relationships between people can change, and a willingness to compromise 
or integrate different opinions together. A lot of that sounds like the Nelson Mandela I remember or insert your favorite wise person there. But that really does begin to give a sense of what is a wise person in the world today. And what is important about what Grossman says is essentially context. Context is everything. Wisdom in one thing does not imply wisdom in another. That's such an important point because often wise people go misunderstood when they do something ordinary or human and in fact might suffer prejudice against them when they do something ordinary or human because they are supposed to be wise. Wisdom clearly does not mean all knowing. Context is everything. There are those who point out that wisdom also requires a certain amount of emotional intelligence as we would call that. So, you know, a wise person has certain beliefs or ideas and will make certain choices and decisions, but they also have feelings about things. And it's the feelings about things that are often where wisdom or the lack of wisdom is very evident, says Thaddeus Metz of the University of Johannesburg. He says that um, things like racism, xenophobia, hatred or repulsion, they, all those things are very shallow judgments of usually people who are different. And so he says, in order to understand wisdom, you must understand the lack of wisdom. And the lack of wisdom consists not only of the false beliefs that lead us to make poor choices or to hate others, but any form of hatred is unwise. There is never a reason for a wise person to respond to something they don't like or someone they don't like with hatred because he suggests hatred to others is always a form of hatred towards yourself and so that should not be confused with humility. Maybe, maybe it's as extreme as that but ultimately Self-hatred does lead to bad decisions, failing to take responsibility for your mistakes, being oversensitive, lashing out at others. Psychologists know that those kind of actions and emotions are often deeply boiled up inside ourselves. And the failure to look within and to contemplate ourselves is one of the reasons that we don't become wise, because a certain amount of humility and self-knowledge are required for wisdom, as we've discussed. But Metz reminds us that it doesn't automatically mean that positive emotions like love and gratitude are automatically signs of the wise. And, you know, that's the... He gives the example of loving a manipulative abuser. And he says, is that really a display of wisdom? Again, quite an extreme example. And I think the whole the whole discussion of wisdom and the whole concept of wisdom is not a solid box with clear outlines because there's always this quality as he has said of emotion and emotion itself doesn't have solid outlines we must be careful not to imagine that a wise person is infallible and that's the point that i'm trying to make there understanding that because we have emotions we're still capable of doing unwise things but having emotions doesn't make us unwise. Wise people generally share kind of an optimism that life's problems will be solved and they generally therefore face difficulties or difficult decisions with a certain amount of calmness. And while sometimes that can be infuriating to people around them who believe that they're not getting how serious this problem is, that calmness comes from this optimism that we will figure it out. We will solve this problem. It may be necessary for wisdom to have that attitude, but it's also necessary to be able to see the bigger picture and understand it, not just assume that all problems will be solved. So wisdom then is better defined as a multidimensional construct that has problem solving, self-knowledge, 
understanding of context, understanding of the proper circumstances, kind of sympathy with the circumstances, understanding the negative and positive constraints of the circumstances. A wise person acts in a value-based fashion, consistent with the knowledge of diversity, consistent in the knowledge of ethics and culture, understanding the multifacetedness of the human experience. The wise person has tolerance towards uncertainty in life and unconditionally accepts whatever may result from it, accepts that because of the uncertainty of life, anything might result, and so therefore I accept it, not making demands and constrictions all the time. A wise person has empathy with themselves to understand their own emotions, to understand and exercise their own morals, and be empathetic, compassionate towards self and others in that process. And perhaps most important, to understand the ability to see yourself as part of a larger whole. To me, from everything we're looking at, everything I've dug into to talk about this, it really seems that that is one of the most defining factors. Obviously, in addition to those other in, uh, characteristics of an individual, it's that ability to see that you're part of a larger whole. And if that is a core understanding, it enables you to act with a larger whole in mind, to act in an unselfish manner, to understand the diversity and so on. Wisdom leads a person to overcome feelings of helplessness or powerlessness, overcome anger and aggression, and leads to the change from the sense of meaningless goals to meaningful goals, because there's the idea we will solve problems, we can work on understanding each other, we can engage constructively with each other and with life's problems. Can we learn to do that? Well, we can certainly aspire to do that. The sad truth is, the evidence does not suggest that wisdom is something that can be taught or learned. So, in studies that were done, you have the examples of students who learnt about the Good Samaritan were no more inclined to help someone than those who hadn't. It was like they get the lesson, but that didn't really seem to affect their behavior. Probably some people get affected by things like that, but clearly not enough. I mean, in some ways it's the same as is a professor or someone who teaches morality automatically a moral person. That's not the case. I mean, there's plenty of teaching about psychology or ethics or even religion or many, many things where that people can get accused of not practicing what they preach. And the, the reason is because we can perhaps intellectually understand what something is that doesn't automatically give us the ability to be there, to do that. So in the same way that it's false to assume that a teacher of morals is automatically moral themselves, we have the right to hold them to a high standard. That's a different matter. We can then say, okay, they don't have those morals. It doesn't mean that what they're saying is false. So it's the same thing. You can learn about the Good Samaritan. It doesn't make you into a Good Samaritan. You still have to take all these steps. You still have to reach to this greater understanding and this greater compassion in order to be there. And perhaps learning about the, the Good Samaritan can inspire you towards more compassion, but ultimately we need a little bit more than that. Teachers who do teach wisdom say that the best way to learn about wisdom is to learn about wise figures from the past. Well, the Good Samaritan story doesn't suggest that, but it does remind me of something that Socrates said. Uh, in this context, he said, the only true wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. There's an elder from the past who I think had it nailed. I'll see you again next week. 
same time, same place.